Brooklyn Independent Television. Caught in the Act is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. Coming up, Sean Lyons does everything he can to help artists, like running rabbit movers where artists can make a living schlepping your stuff. It's not just a business, but it really does support artists, and art is kind of pouring out of it. Here we have it. For Artem Miralevich, it was a near-fatal incident when he was a teenager that drove him to focus on art. Life is too short and too serious of a thing to waste. Tall Tall Trees talks about going to Alaska together and coming back inspired to make new music. This is an album of songs that we recorded. We had a big debate over whether it was a record or an album. This is an album. And in Greenpoint, J.R.D. spits Polish rhymes at the Club Europa crowd. They're all caught in the act, art in Brooklyn. My name's Sean Lyons, and I run Rabbit Hole. It's a gallery and an art space, and I run Rabbit Movers, a moving company that, uh, that just hires artists and works with artists and, and finds ways to support the artists. It's kind of funny. Um, when, I was, uh, when I was a kid, my mom got me into modeling for a little bit, and, uh, and that was my one gig. <laughs> I think I'm six in this picture. I don't know, it's our version of like the company motivational poster or something. We started only hiring artists, I think, in 2005. And right away it just worked out really nicely like, because it gave an identity to the company and it felt more like a community than it did a, a job. And that was, a, it was just a great feeling. You know, people would come to work at Rabbit and form a band together or do all kinds of collaborations together just from meeting each other at Rabbit. A starving artist is, you can die from starvation, so it's good to, <laughs> good to work and make some money and get some food. And you can take off whatever you need, if you've got a gig, if you have uh, something else to focus on. If, you, if you're inspired for a couple of days, take some time off moving and get your ideas down. It just kind of evolved from there. After a couple years, I rented a space down here as an office. And the, the first show we did, our office was behind this, this wall. This was going to be short-term storage for the moving company. Um, but uh, the storage wasn't really working out, and, and I was getting bored with just doing the moving company and wanted to do something different. And, um, and so, uh, so we organized uh, a dance performance was the first thing that we did here. And, and the dancers, we had, uh, it was over two nights, I think we had six dancers perform each night, and they would just dance between here and, and about here. They had this space, and we didn't have any chairs or anything, but we had about 30 people lined up against the wall in kind of three rows um, watching the performance, and it was, it was great. We changed the exhibit every month. Then we also have the Rabbit Tales. It's a reading series that we do once a month. And we rent the space out for photo shoots and events. It stays pretty lively in here. We have nine studios that we rent out. Um, and it's a great little community. In this studio is Brooklyn Creative. Um, we offer classes in, in digital photography and all elements of, of photography. So you got it on, you got it on cloudy right now. Where, where, where should we go with Just yeah, try the um, try, try date, day white. 
about a year ago, we started using our trucks as pop-up galleries. We call those art attacks. And we curate, for the most part, from within the company. We do our best to try to recreate a, a gallery feel. My overall experience has been very amazing just because it's taking me out of a room and it's exposing me and my artwork to a whole new different crowd. I want to get it smooth enough so that our artists that on any day can just on their own decide to put on a show. I like that idea, that we can just sort of have a, an instant show anywhere, anytime. I like playing with the space and with ideas of what can be done with it and where things belong and where they don't belong and, and just putting a question mark above that, above those ideas. Went to college in Philadelphia, majored in writing but lived at the art school there and that's kind of where I got my, my um, interest in the arts. During college, I spent my summers in Alaska and lived in the woods in Alaska while working in the canneries. After college, I went up to San Francisco and just kind of had that, um, that wake-up call that you get when you're out of college and you realize you have to get you know, a, a full-time job and pay a lot of money for an apartment. And, and, um, and I just, I, just uh, I don't know, I didn't want to do it. <laughs> I kind of wanted to recreate my Alaska experience in the woods, but in, in a city. And what I ended up doing kind of grew organically, uh, building and, and living in what I called the hole. It was kind of a hobbit hole, that's the best way to describe it. It was in Land's End, near the cliffs, kind of between the beach and Golden Gate Bridge, there were a bunch of cliffs. And so it was a good spot, and it took two months to dig. It was clean and warm and cozy, and and had a wood floor and, and a little table with a stove on it and, and a rocking chair and a bed and bookshelves with, with books and plates and it was, it was nice. The hole was the first place I think that I had that felt like home. I was challenging myself and I was challenging ideas of what's normal and what's not and what's allowed and what's not allowed. And I think just by doing that it just it gave me a sense of self-worth and, and kind of excitement that made the other parts of my life more bearable. So it felt like home, but it also felt more than that. I, I think I've, I've tried to recreate spaces like that. A little after that I got a sailboat and lived there for a couple years. I still have that now on, on uh, Newtown Creek and another boat on the Gowanus that I'm fixing up. That also kind of has that same feeling. It's kind of a refuge and it's sort of transporting and I mean, that's, that was the thing with the hole too. When I went in it made me feel like I was far away from where I was, from, far away from the city. In a way far from my work and far from my problems and it was sort of a sanctuary. But also I like to think of rabbit hole as an extension of that experience. And rabbit movers too is, I guess I, I always saw that that way, like a place where people can come to work, where we give them the freedom to, to follow their dreams and to, to be who they want to be and, and to take the time that they need to figure out how to do that. If rabbit was just a kind of a regular moving company, uh, I think I'd be really bored. But this gives it uh, more purpose. It's not just a business, but it really does support artists, and art is pouring out of it, and that just feels really good. And, and at the same time, just really becoming one of the best moving companies out there, but having that creative dynamic makes me feel like this is worth doing. Ever since I remember myself, I, I was drawing, like through, through my childhood, through my uh, school, high school. Uh, when I was 17, I had a near-death experience. I, I was stabbed in a street fight in Russia, and I almost died. 
the doctor who was taking me to the hospital told me to save your energy because you're either going to die or you will be crippled for the rest of your life. And that was about a minute before I saw the light at the end of the tunnel and I realized at that point that life is too short and too serious of a thing to waste, which really turned my life around and decided to take my talent seriously and dedicate my life to art. What happened after was kind of uh, like a fairy tale, because once I made that decision, everything kind of fell in place. Shortly after that incident, we moved to the United States, and while I lived in Russia, I never thought I considered an art career seriously. First of all, because it was the 90s, and it was just a crazy world that turned upside down. My whole family moved to the States, and we moved to Buffalo, which is a small town upstate, and I was very lucky. I uh, had a wonderful art teacher. Uh, put a portfolio together, I applied to School of Visual Arts and I got in on the first day and they gave me a full scholarship. A lot of my inspiration comes from mythology and even religious stories, so to speak. So, sort of a combined image of uh, Noah's Ark and uh, Flying Dutchman and kind of uh, image of our civilization as a, as a ship. You know, something that's afloat and very uh, strong and you know very technically advanced and then one day you come home and it's not there. Also another theme that runs through my uh, art is the tree of life. In 98 I took an exchange semester in the Ridfield Art Academy of Amsterdam which was a wonderful experience and that's where I first was introduced to etching which is the medium that I feel very passionate about now. It's a very rigorous and complicated process, but once you know all the technical details, you can, uh, you can express yourself uh, in various forms, just with the, with the line and with the fades. I just like the process. I like the, the fact that the process actually hasn't really changed in the last 500 years and I like that hands-on making your artwork. And uh, here we have it. So this is all the stages that I had to uh, go through to get to where I'm at now uh, with all the details and depth of field. Uh, and it's actually stage number 10 right now and I might have to do one or two more stages to get the etching finalized. I work in different mediums and uh, one of my latest, most favorite ones is the uh, wire. For me it's a continuation of etching, it's kind of a three-dimensional drawing in space. I'm on the right path. It's not an easy path, but you know, I definitely know that it's the right path for me. Hello, my name is Matthias. I play drums and some percussion in this band. Uh, I came over here from Switzerland a long time ago. I'm Kyle, Kyle Santa. I've moved here, play guitar and keyboards. I'm Mike Savino. I play banjo and guitar and uh, sing. I'm Ben Campbell. I've been playing with Tall Tall Trees for like three years now. I'm the newest member. I play bass. As any band needs a name, we picked Tall Tall Trees. Kyle and I have had probably maybe the most similar, you know, um, 
mm-hmm. history is, you know, when you start playing guitar as a kid, you know, you start you know, listening to Led Zeppelin and the Beatles and trying to figure that stuff out. That's kind of, we had a similar sort of a story, all of us. I mean, we all more or less started out playing rock, you know, with our friends, and, and all of us sort of got into the whole jazz things, and we started a lot of music, and, and got, you know, played with a lot of different bands from all mm-hmm. over with all these different things, and, and traveled, but somehow finding back to more rock. This is an album of songs that we recorded. We had a <laughs> Big debate over whether it was a record or an album. This is an album. The new sound also started from a, a trip to Alaska that we all took. And um, the first song that that Mike wrote from the, new, from the new record is called Alaska, and it was written up there actually on, on a kayak. We were yeah. all on kayaks. That started a whole chain of songs about this idea of escaping and looking for different connections with nature and with my friends. So all those things kind of spawned all the new songs on our new record, or at least a good portion of them. Whereas the second record, Moment, um, we were in a studio for uh, chunk of time, 10 days, and we did it all, you know, more or less in, in, in that time. It was also really beautiful outside of New York City. It was uh, in a studio near Woodstock. Go in the studio and record, and then, you know, two people go out and make make dinner for everybody. And, and somebody else makes a snow angel. Yeah, somebody else makes a snow yeah. angel. You know, yeah. it's like kind of very communal, communal living, creating kind of situation, which was really mm-hmm. yeah. inspiring. And we learned to work together, I mean, in more in those 10 days than we probably have in, in you know, two years. Travel is fun to get out, but coming back is also a very rewarding thing because you know you live somewhere really, really, you know, exciting. To me, Brooklyn has been, you know, home for plus for ten and a half years, and. Um, it's been pretty intense, you know. I would say I kind of have a somewhat of a love-hate relationship with, with New York City altogether, being a country boy and all that from a small town. But in some kind of way, it, it, it just, it's just like a magnet, you know, I, I can't really leave it yet. For now, it's just been, or for the past 10 years, it's just been this crazy pop of like all these different things happening. I mean, different neighborhoods, you drive a block, you walk a block, and it's a whole different story. You know, it, it, it's just, it's endless, you know, in terms of inspiration and, and, and just also musically alone, it's, it's obviously a, a super cool place to be in because you go out and you meet new musicians like every night. All of us here, you know, what makes, one thing that makes us unique is we're, we're all full-time musicians. You know, we all pretty much dedicate our time to being musicians or producers, session people, which, you know, leads you to play so many different kinds of music that your scope of influence becomes so sometimes hard to focus on what you do. And that's what we, where we had with our first record, although it's a fun record and stuff, it was all over the place stylistically because we just could do all these things because we, we had been doing all these things. And I think with our new record, we kind of decided this is what we sound like. And it's come from a couple years of evolution playing live. You know, we're good friends, so yeah. we had a lot of fun. And uh, It could know. have seriously gone in some like shining direction. Oh, totally, <laughs> it totally could have. Making this record was really kind of a special experience and I think it shines through on the album that it feels like one cohesive piece. That was our, you know, it would have been a much different record if we, if I was taking the, uh, the C train to a studio through, you know, morning rush hour and getting off and walking to the studio and meeting these guys there rather than waking up and making breakfast and talking about what we're doing today, you know, that's a big difference, big difference. Yeah, it was good fun. Mm. Let's do it yeah. again. Yeah, let's maybe want to make a record. Yeah, third record. <laughs>
My name is JRD. I live in Beirut and uh, I'm a Polish hip-hop artist. I'm from the southeastern part of Poland. It's called Podkarpacze and uh, I came to US in July 2004. About a year ago or more I started performing solo but also with a big help of one of my best friends, Natalia. A few months ago we performed with Natalia at this Polish club Europa in Greenpoint. We were a part of a bigger event. One of the songs we did was a mood uplifting so you know like that no matter how hard things may seem to be you know you, ha you have to hang, hang on to your dreams and hopes you know and never give up on them. Hey, my name is DJ Gramax. I'm a DJ over here in New York City. Uh, I'm also a promoter. I run Gramax Promotions. I bring over uh, European artists mostly from Poland and Eastern Europe to the United States and we I organize shows in New York, Chicago, Detroit, Toronto, and Florida. GRAMX.com, that's the website for Polish Hip Hop United States. And uh, we're gonna have uh, a lot of shows coming up this year. JRD is, uh, has a great potential as a European rapper. I know it might sound funny to Americans, especially in New York, uh, when you rap in Polish or when you rap in German or, or Swedish or say, on any other language, but uh, uh, hip hop is a culture that was originated over here in New York City, but it went all over the world, it made a circle. It came back to New York in different languages, different forms. And uh, right now people like JRD uh, embrace the culture, embrace uh, hip hop and rap music. Uh, and uh, obviously, you know, since I'm from Europe, I, I'm all the way behind them. And uh, if I see potential, if I see talent, I'm, uh, I want to support it. The qualities that you're looking for in rapper is originality and uh, being able to find himself, you know, his unique style. So uh, I see that I see that in uh, in Euron, JRD. First time I heard the Polish hip hop was in 1999. It was introduced to me by my cousin, and he played to me one of the guys who were, uh, I guess, pioneers of the hip hop in Poland. They 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 are called Kaliber Czerciszczery. At the beginning, you know, when I started writing out here, when I came. That, that's, that's the only thing I had left, you know, I had, I had no friends, nothing else, so I started writing. There was this thing about my studies going on back then, so, you know, I was immediately started searching for those other Polish immigrants that live, you know, across the New York. And then I met Brzytwa, because I heard he had one song of his that he made on the computer, and uh, on, on his profile, I was like, oh, you rap, I rap too, you know, let's get together, you know. We started to perform together as a group called Wirwańs Korzeni. What it means, I think it's full out of the roots of origin. Polish hip-hop started pretty much uh, in the 80s and uh, in, during communism. And the Polish hip-hop really, you know, helped the Polish uh, youth, you know, it helped them to find themselves. You know, every time when system changes, you know, when somebody's going to get hurt and it's usually the people at the, at the lower end of the, of the food chain. The system changes left pretty much 30% uh, of the country living in poverty, 70% uh, of the country was struggling, and all these young kids, they didn't know what to do with themselves. They needed inspiration, they needed somebody to lift their spirits, and hip hop did just that. Just like in New York City, 1970s were a really tough time for New York, and hip hop kind of kept the spirits of New Yorkers. So there is an analogy between uh, New York hip hop and uh, Polish hip hop. Right now, Poland, 60-70% of the young kids listen to hip-hop, so it has a lot of influence. I can sit on the train and listen to a beat because that's what I mostly listen to lately, it's to the instrumentals and and all of a sudden something, you know, just clicks and I just began writing, you know, I don't even know what I'm... It's a weird thing, you know, because most of the times I first write and then I think about what I just had written. My lyrics are a bit influenced, influenced by conspiracy theories and spiritual stuff, as well as bragging about myself. The style of rap that's called braggadocio, mostly that's what I write my lyrics about, you know, how trying to pro prove myself, you know, how good I am, you know, by the use of metaphors. I'm on my spiritual search, you know, looking for the answers. And a lot, a lot of time I spent digging into Buddhism 
and other religions and you know people who don't even understand what I'm saying they say it sounds good we are a small Polish, Polish community out here in the US but on the other side of the token you know if somebody out here who, who's in the business is gonna notice me you know super super then probably he'll have connections for me for some for things to happen back in Poland. Yeah, I plan to work on an album. I'm gonna, I don't know, maybe send it to some labels or other production companies to Poland and see if, whether they're gonna like it. If they're gonna like it, maybe something's gonna happen. If they're not gonna like it, I'm gonna have to keep doing what I'm doing, you know? Because I don't plan on stopping. Ale daję dalej, ty słuchaj Turu, nie słuchaj tego wcale, mówię kody, wywodzę wokół, widzę same fraktale, ja kanią wie piekie przez życia, autostradę jadę. Watch this and other Brooklyn Independent Television episodes online at brickartsmedia.org slash BIT.